Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Total Biscuit. We have ourselves a fish out of water, yeah? After lurking in the briny deep for quite some time, the creator of Fez Phil Fish popped up, surfaced for air, and decided, in doing so, that he would fire a few shots in the direction of YouTube gaming content creators. Shortly after that, he disappeared beneath the waves again by protecting his Twitter account, but before that, it was of course recorded by various gaming websites such as GameSpot, who should watch out because Phil Fish may be attempting to claim royalties for his tweets next. We'll see what happens. Anyway, what came from Phil Fish on the subject of creating gaming content, and I assume he's aiming this primarily at Let's Play. If he's not, then that, that just boggles the mind and just goes in the face of everything that free critique, speech, and journalism stands for. He claimed that ad revenue should be shared with developers, and YouTubers should have to pay out a huge portion of their revenue to the developers from which they steal all their content. Not a great way to start the discussion, is it, by basically poisoning the well before you've taken your first sip from it. Follow-up tweets read as follows. If you generate money from putting my content on your channel, you owe me money. Simple as that. If you buy a movie, are you then allowed to stream the entirety of it publicly for people to watch for free? No, because that's illegal. Systems are in place to prevent it, but buy fares, put all of it on YouTube, turn on ads, make money from it, and that is totally fine. And the developer should in no way be compensated for their work being freely distributed to the world. Right. Makes sense. He then followed up with Nevermind and went back to the depths of the indie game ocean, hungry for delicious algae. Why, why was it Phil Fish that had to start this discussion of all people? Uh, you could not really find someone who is more unsuited to the public gaming lifestyle, I suppose. And that's coming from someone who is very unsuited to the public gaming lifestyle and has had many problems in the past, and yet somehow every day I wake up and thank the Lord on high that I did not say something as silly as Phil Fish did. Anyway, let's try and start the discussion right, shall we? Started off not particularly well. Let's just ignore who said it. And let's look at the principle behind it. What is driving his opinion? Why does he think this? And then we can analyze whether or not it's correct, the role of the YouTube content creator in today's modern gaming landscape. And we can think about such things as whether or not a portion of revenue should be given to the game creator. So why does he believe this, first and foremost? Well, we noticed in one of his tweets that he equated the coverage of games on YouTube to movie piracy. And he's specifically aiming at the idea of putting out a full playthrough. He doesn't seem to be mentioning anything along the lines of, say, WTF is coverage or Northern Lions stuff or anything along those lines. He doesn't seem to be specifically aiming at that, though his tweets, unfortunately, are very general. If you generate money from putting my content on your channel, you owe me money simple as that. So what I'm doing in the background right now... According to that tweet, Phil Fish believes that I owe him money for that, which of course isn't true, but regardless, that's what that tweet said. And now we have discovered the reason why Twitter is a fairly terrible way to deliver a complex message. But is there any validity to what he's saying? If we go past the way that he said it and we look at the sentiment, is there any validity to that? Is it okay for a developer to believe that since coverage of their game has been put on YouTube in a fairly complete manner, i.e. a complete playthrough or at least semi-complete playthrough, that the developer should be entitled to royalties and more to the point, is it similar? to movie piracy. It's a very strange time when we see game developers compare themselves to movie creators and movies as a medium, because for the longest time we've been fighting against this very idea that we should be compared to such things. It's a very different medium, it's a very different artistic creative process, and more to the point, the way that the medium is communicated to the viewer, in this case the player, is fundamentally different. The artistic vision of the creator in a movie is of course paramount, you have no way to alter that artistic vision. However, in a video game, your artistic vision really only goes so far because you're allowing me to interact with it, which means that I may attempt to change it in some way. Something that you would have preferred that I did, you may find that I chose not to do. And many creators cater for that by offering multiple choices, but it doesn't even come down to just that. Because maybe you're thinking, well, the only games that really allow for that level of interactivity are the ones that actually give you these fundamental choices. No, every single thing you ever do in a video game is a choice. 
down to the very last key press. It differentiates you from everybody else that's playing the game in a small way. The idea that you, for the most part, have control over the camera, whereas in a movie it would be given to the director himself. The idea that you could cut dialogue short or even change it in many different scenarios and games such as RPGs. Even with games like Dear Esther, at least you have the freedom to come away with your own interpretation of what's going on, or indeed the freedom to just stop walking entirely. It's about as much freedom as you get in a game like that, but you are talking about one of the most restrictive games on the market when it comes to allowing the player to actually play it. That is actually a game that if shown on YouTube in its entirety, you would pretty much get the same experience from. Indeed, one might argue that it's better because it doesn't hurt your middle finger from holding down the W key for 90 minutes. Both on a technical and conceptual level, it's blindingly obvious that games and movies are two very different things, and comparisons between the two are not particularly relevant. Philosophically, an argument can of course be made that this content is driven by the person that made it in the first place, and that you're merely riding on the coattails of that, and frankly, I often agree with that particular sentiment. I don't think that everything he's saying is completely outlandish. I think there's a kernel of truth to it. It's just a shame that it was expressed in such a way. I feel that respect should be shown to the work and that your work should in some way be transformative. You should be able to provide a unique experience by using this content that you have been given and the interactive medium is what allows that to happen. Now, this happens to greater or lesser extent on a game by game basis. In multiplayer titles, you can argue that almost everything that is going on when it comes to the creative process of that video comes from you. It's your skill and the skill of the people you're playing against that creates the content. Each story is very much unique, and the game merely provides the props. The actors are in fact the players. The script is written by the players. The game is a playset, it's a sandbox in which to create a unique event. However, if you were to look at single player titles, many of them do include heavily scripted sections such as cutscenes which do use real voice actors and real motion cap artists. And in those kind of scenarios, you could make a stronger argument that at least part of that is owned by the company that created the game, because you as a content creator are not able to alter what is going on in that scene. The majority of a game does not consist of those scenes. Well, if it does, it's either by David Cage or bloody terrible. Some might argue there's a crossover there, but as a stalwart defender of Heavy Rain, I refuse to allow you to say that. However, this does bring us along to a fairly interesting idea. The notion that the reason that these games are apparently being watched as opposed to being played, at least that's apparently what Phil believes if he thinks that we're taking money out of his pocket. I have to wonder if that's actually what he thinks, it's hard to tell. But in theory, if your game is good and it's being demonstrated in such a way, then it should evoke a strong desire in the viewer to actually pick it up and play it themselves, because there is a fundamental difference between playing a game and watching somebody else play a game. They are actually two different forms of media entirely and one should hopefully feed quite nicely into the other. We see that work both ways. In terms of, say, a game like StarCraft II or League of Legends, many of the players watch other people playing, either to learn how to better play the game, or simply because they enjoy the competitive esports aspect of things. They like it to be shown at the highest level. And the obvious other way around is you watch a bit of a game to get a feel for it, and you think, wow, I would really love to play that myself. That sounds like a great idea, and as a direct result of watching that Let's Play video or piece of coverage on YouTube, you go and you purchase the title. And there is a distinct amount of synergy there. But when you create a game that is perhaps so heavily story driven and restricts player choice to such a degree because that is your artistic vision, then that actually does have some downsides, I'm afraid. I can go and read the full spoilers for Fez or any other game that has distinct lore or story driven elements, and I can maybe come away from it feeling like I've actually got a part of the experience there. If I watch a video, I may perhaps believe that I've come away with more of the experience, but that is highly unlikely. Even when you look at something like Fez, which does have a lot of secrets that were uncovered, and around its launch on the 360, there were considerable communities that sprung up in discussion of the game and looking to try and figure out what was going on. And that was a, a very powerful experience for a lot of people. I remember listening to the Bombcast around that time. Every single week, there was something new about Fez, something that people had uncovered, theories regarding it. It was vibrant. It was 
really quite fantastic. And quite a lot of that, by the way, was driven by Let's Play on YouTube and video coverage because that game was only out on 360 at the time. The only way that it could be experienced by those who did not own a 360 would be either through reading about it or by watching it. I also have no doubt that that coverage also drove sales on the eventual PC version. Thank you for giving our humble spreadsheet machines a little taste of your game, by the way, Phil. Much appreciated there. Even very heavily narrative-focused titles such as The Stanley Parable benefited significantly from YouTube Let's Play, to the point where a special version was created for the Game Grumps. That shows a good degree of adaptation to the current media landscape that surrounds video games, and the fact that YouTube is a thriving place to find footage of pretty much every game you can possibly imagine. As the creator of Mount Your Friends, Dan Steger says, I try to approach the reality versus the ideal. Some devs don't want their games, quote, spoiled, unquote, by LPs, but LPs are a known thing, so anyone that tries to stifle that is pushing against the current when they should design with it in mind instead. He goes on to make the quip that it's a good thing that LPs and YouTubers exist because I suck at making trailers to advertise my own games. I think you clearly know my opinion when it comes to storytelling. I believe video games are an interactive medium, and as a direct result, your story should be told in an interactive way. And if you do that, then watching is merely a portion of the real experience that you will receive. It's like peeking through the door of a cinema. It's not the same as buying a ticket and sitting in the seat for the full experience. What can I say? I wanted to match one dumb movie analogy with my own. Indeed, there are very few good analogies that actually work when comparing another form of media to video games. They are simply too different. Every other form of media is non-interactive. And as a direct result, we've got a rather interesting, brave new world, perhaps a Wild West, as some may argue, and something that the law has definitely not caught up to. And we can wrangle about this stuff, and we should wrangle about it, as long as we do so in a constructive fashion, and not fire ridiculous shots over at people that have really done nothing but try to help you. But, as some of you will say, and certainly not without merit, look at all of these people that are making money off the back of somebody else's work. Okay, this is a point that I feel I've debunked in the past before, but I'm going to attempt to do it once again anyway. The idea that you are taking money from someone else's work, well, you have to look at it in a couple of different ways. First, are you directly taking money out of the pocket of somebody? Uh, are we basically going to make the piracy argument? As far as I'm concerned, there is no way to prove that that is the case, unless your game wasn't very good in the first place. Generally speaking, in my experience, and I can back this up with innumerable metrics, thanks to the fact that I track pretty much every clickable link that I've ever put in my YouTube videos over the last three or four years, and of course talking to innumerable indie devs on this particular subject, I can safely say that if you put out a good game and the Let's Player or YouTube commentator or whatever creates a good video about it, then that will drive sales guaranteed at least to some degree. If you make a bad game and the Let's Player slash YouTube commentator points that out, then it will not drive sales or indeed it may drive people away from what would otherwise have been a sale, but of course there is absolutely no guarantee there, which is why the piracy arguments generally fall to pieces, because they're talking about the idea of lost revenue when they are completely unable to prove that that person would have bought the game in the first place. Let's Play and YouTube coverage such as WTF is, is more often than not the closer, one way or the other. It will either drive the sale, it will push someone over the edge and get them to buy it, or it will drive people away and it will give them the evidence they need to make the informed decision that this game actually wasn't worth their money. One way or the other, the result is always the same, as long as the coverage is done fairly and does not contain misinformation. The consumer is more informed than they previously were to begin with. Now, if you do not want the consumer to be informed, and you would like to benefit from the sales that come from that, then what I would state is that you are anti-consumer and you are inherently dishonest. An informed consumer is the best kind of consumer, and if you believe that you create games that are of high quality, then an informed and discerning consumer is exactly what you are looking to sell to, and I would imagine that you would want more of those things. So I do not believe that a Let's Play is taking the money out of the pocket of a developer, which is really what piracy is in a nutshell. Why do we object to piracy? Well, most of us object to it on the grounds that it hurts developers, whether they be of movies, books, video games, music, and so on and so forth, 
because they're not being paid for their work. But in reality, when it comes to things like Let's Play, it's not a case of being paid for your work. That video is not your work. It is a video of your work. And more to the point, it is a video of your work combined with the work of the person playing it. And that is certainly not equivalent. There's no doubt about that. You put more work into your game than they put into their video. Obviously. We get that. That's fine. But that's not actually how the world works. It's not a meritocracy. What we're talking about is the idea of the power of the audience and the fact that the audience was built by the person that was playing the game in the first place. And this is where the real value of these videos lies. And I talk not only about the value to a developer, but also its inherent market value. Once you get past a certain point in your audience, it becomes more valuable to the developer that a video is made on a specific topic or game than it does to the person making it in the first place. Whatever PewDiePie plays is going to get over 1 million views. That is pretty much a guarantee at this point. In many cases, it's more like 3 million plus. It doesn't matter what he plays, and in my case, it doesn't actually matter what I play either. Is there a difference between the view counts of my videos? Absolutely, no doubt about that. If I do a video of a AAA title, will I receive more views than I would from covering an indie title? Yeah, sure. Well, look at my Watch Dogs video. We scroll back in time, what do we find? Watch Dogs 848,000 views over the course of about three weeks. Compare that to, let's see... I need something around the same time frame. Transistor, 308,000 views. Wolfenstein, 516,000 views. All of those fairly anticipated. Ascendant, you know, that's, a, that's around the same kind of time frame. That was four days before that, 196,000 views. Definitely a clear difference there. There are some games that generate more interest than others. But there is that certain baseline where anything I make is going to be worth my time to make in the first place. I, I am very happy with my Ascendant video. My Ascendant video took less time to make than my Watch Dogs video did. F fact of the matter is that most indie games are easier to understand and easier to critique because they're not as complex, they don't have as many mechanics. When it comes to a lot of AAA games, they try and take an absolutely massive bucket of mechanics and toss them all into the same game, and there are many things to look at. Fez, on the other hand, only has a few buttons, and its key mechanic is obvious as soon as you go into the game, as are many indie titles like that. They are simply games designed in a smaller scope, and that is totally fine. But there is a certain amount of our audience that will watch whatever the hell we do, regardless of what it happens to be. They are the key component of our audience. They are the core audience of our channels, and those Members of that audience are people that we have attracted ourselves. We have brought them in to our audience and we have kept them there, which is difficult enough, I might add, on YouTube. YouTube audiences are highly volatile and will very quickly dive to another channel if they smell even a hint of something that they personally disagree with. Whether or not that's rational is a different matter entirely. It's that audience that gives those channels value. And at that point, you could make the opposing argument that if you are going to choose a game to show to that audience, then you are basically giving free promotion, free coverage to that game. And that is true of Let's Play as much as it is true of doing a critical video. When I make a critical video, it may be that I absolutely bloody well hate your game. The chances are you're only going to let's play a game that you are at least enjoying enough to bloody well finish in the first place. There is a benefit to allowing that long-form content to exist versus, say, a piece of content that exists simply to critique the game. I usually make one video of a game and I move on. There are a few exceptions like, say, Dota 2 or Hearthstone, but most of the time it will be one video and then move on. And there is, of course, nothing that any developer can do about that because it would be in violation of fair use principle. However, when it comes to Let's Play, that audience has significant value, to the point, by the way, where many developers are actually willing to pay for direct access to it. Significant amount of money is being spent on targeted branded content for channels like this. And when you get a similar kind of content for free, the last thing you should be doing is turning around and demanding royalties from it. Indeed, a strong argument could be made for the opposite. We are giving our audience to you. We are dedicating a significant portion of our day and indeed our channel space, which is both highly limited and highly valuable, to you, to your game exclusively. 
that holds significant both inherent and monetary value. It is significant promotion. Now, I don't know about you, but I'd never want to be in a situation where I was asking for royalties from a game developer. That sounds fairly ludicrous, but it also sounds equally ludicrous to ask for royalties if you are a game developer when someone is covering your game, whether it be with a single video or whether it be with long-form Let's Play content. I do feel that those people should very much respect the title, they should make everybody aware of who made it and where to buy it, and if they do not do so, then they are failing when it comes to properly crediting the original artists. That said, I also don't believe that many of those channels actually exist. Even the largest channels like PewDiePie do properly credit and properly drive traffic to the games that they actually play. There is already an existing quid pro quo in place that seems to work very well for the vast majority of developers, and when that quid pro quo is disrupted, you usually see not only the outcry of YouTubers and their viewers, but also of developers themselves. The last time we had the big content ID sweep, you saw developers falling over themselves in an attempt to help those that had been stung by it unfairly. We're talking about big companies here that you wouldn't necessarily expect to do things like that. We're talking about Ubisoft, we're talking about Epic Games, we're talking about Capcom that come out and help in these kind of situations. It is extremely rare outside of Japanese developers like Nintendo that you will ever see a games publisher or developer come out in favor of the idea that those who create content on YouTube should have some or all of their ad revenue taken away as a direct result. That is not a popular viewpoint, and it is not well supported either. It doesn't make any sense within the games ecosystem. And make no mistake, by the way, if this were to go forward, which in theory Phil Fish could actually do, I feel bad actually telling him about this, maybe he hasn't realized it, but he could register with the content ID system and he could take any of the scripted sequences from Fez and match that footage up with other footage which also uses that scripted sequence and he could claim that ad revenue. Feel free. You know what's going to happen? <laughs> I can tell you exactly what's going to happen. Those videos will rapidly start to disappear. People will stop covering those titles. And really all you're doing is shooting yourself in the foot. You can have a little bit of cash and then people will simply ignore your game in future. They will decide not to cover it. And there are, for every developer that believes this is a good idea, a hundred more that will jump at the chance to take your spot on a popular channel. They will take that spot and the channel owner themselves will embrace them happily. And where will you be left at that point? It seems particularly insane to hear this from an indie dev. I can understand when it comes from the mouths of a company that's going to be selling millions regardless of whether or not YouTubers do coverage on it, although we can still drive sales even to AAAs regardless of that. There is no doubt in my mind, and I have the numbers to prove it. They're all public. Go feel free to look at any of my WTFS videos. Take the bit.ly link, put a plus after it. That's going to tell you exactly how many people have clicked that link to go and buy the game. Sure, it's not proof that they actually went through with the sale, but the fact of the matter is finding games on Steam is very easy and the majority of people that go to buy games as a result of my coverage don't even use those links in the first place because they have Steam open by default. That's what PC gamers do. Oh, something's on the front page. Click, 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 done. That took me three seconds. Problem solved. Anyway, that's besides the point. Even AAAs do not pull this stuff with very rare exceptions like Sega of Japan and of course Nintendo of Japan who have attempted to do things like this before. It does nobody any good because here's the reality of it. They didn't come for your game. They came for X personality playing your game and they would just as happily take X personality playing somebody else's game over yours. That's totally fine for them. They come to enjoy that person's particular take on the games that they are playing. And while there is variance, no doubt, in the numbers that are gained by various different titles on Let's Play channels, there is still always going to be that baseline that are always coming regardless of the game to simply watch that person in action. Devaluing that is denying reality. Thank you very much for watching, folks. I'll see you next time.